Welcome, uh, Councilman Shama Smalik, uh, for you. your, uh, t to come today to have this conversation with us. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to do just a brief introduction here, uh, and I'm sure I won't note all the highlights, so I'll end with asking you to, uh, to provide uh, some thoughts as to why you, why now for our community. But uh, we had provided the full bio and links to his site uh, on our registration site as well. But just briefly, for those of you who don't know him, Shamas Malik is a current city councilman serving the people of Akron's 8th Ward and serves on four committees including public safety, budget and finance, parks and recreation, and rules. He's born and raised in Northwest Akron, Shamas attended Firestone High School and participated in the International Baccalaureate Program which helped him earn a scholarship to The Ohio State University. At Ohio State, Shama studied political science, international studies, and went on to graduate cum laude from Harvard Law School. After finishing his law degree, he came home to contribute to the community that has made such an impact on him, spending two years as an assistant director of law in the city of Akron Law Department, prior to joining city council a number of years ago. He believes deeply that together we can build a stronger and more equitable Akron and is running for mayor to do just that. Councilman, thank you again for being here with us today. And tell us at this time sort of why you, why now? Give us some opening thoughts as we get into this today. Absolutely. Um, well, first, thank you all for being here today. Um, we are having a lot of these discussions. We have one tonight at the Akron Urban League. And I'm really enjoying them because I think the more that we get our ideas out there, we're getting feedback, we're refining them. And I think really getting the pulse of where the community is at. Um, I'm running for mayor for kind of a simple reason. I was born and raised here, and I'm not going to go through the whole bio, but I believe deeply in this community. I'm sitting in front of you because, in part, my Akron Public Schools education allowed me to get a scholarship to OSU, allowed me really the surreal opportunity to go to Harvard Law School. I didn't know anyone who went to Harvard before I had a chance to go there. Um, but I moved back home because I wanted to serve this community, because my mom taught for 20 some years at the University of Akron, teaching chemical engineering, and she served this community. And I get every day to try to improve this place, just like, like all of us do in our own different fields, in our own different ways. But Akron has been lacking a vision for where it's going, right? For my whole life, and really decades before that, we have lost population, even while the population of Summit County has really remained flat. And so we ask ourselves why people are leaving because of safety, because of schools, and also because of jobs and housing. But safety in the schools are the things that we hear most about, particularly these last few years, particularly as of late. And I think that we have a lot of bright spots, right? We have these community learning centers that a lot of other communities you know, would love to have this, this space. We have amazing leaders across our community, but what we don't have is a shared, bold vision of where we're going for Akron's future. And that's been clear to me over the last few years of being on council. We have a city government that's, in my opinion, too top-down, uh, where it's not as consensus minded as it could be, and that has hampered our opportunity to make real sustained progress on those basic things. You know, when I started on council, it was right before COVID, and you know, it's been a turbulent time ever since. But we got $145 million from the federal government, and this wasn't free money, this is taxpayer money. The decisions for how to spend that money were made by one person in the community. Right? City council delegated its authority to the mayor to make those decisions. And some of them I agreed with, some of them I disagreed with. But fundamentally, we need to have an opportunity for a community conversation about those priorities. The result of, of having one person do it has been that we are having struggles with implementation. We're having a hard time getting the money out the door and getting those projects up and running because we didn't spend time building the consensus around those things. We have across our community, and I'll, I'll slow down, uh, all these plans, we have a youth violence strategic plan, we have an age-friendly Akron plan, we have the Elevate Greater Akron plan, we have all of these things. But so often we work on them for a couple years and then they go on the shelf and we move on to the next crisis and we work on that plan for a couple years and then that goes on the shelf. I think what we really need is a bold vision for where we're going. I think, I think our campaign has laid out the strongest vision around those four key areas that I mentioned, safety, jobs, education, and housing. And that's why I'm running. So uh, I'm going to pick up on a couple of things that you yep. said, and we'll kind of dive into it. Because as I said, there are a lot of forums going on, and a lot of them are going to different topics. Love to focus a lot today on jobs, yep. economic development, um, and and sort of the growth of the economy of our community. So let's let's pick up on ARPA. Yep. Uh, so you talked about the fact that um, the mayor has made these decisions and sort of prioritized these funds. 
what do you think have been some of the bright spots of where that focus has been? And if you were sitting in that seat with the ability to make those decisions on your own, what are a couple of things that you might have done a little bit differently there? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to be clear that you know, $145 million in priorities, there's definitely a lot of them that I agree with. The mayor has this housing rehab program that has helped a lot of people in some of our neighborhoods. You know, a lot of people own homes, but they're getting older and people struggle to figure out how they're gonna help, you know, repair the, the uh, stairs going up to the door or help put in ADA accessibility. And so this program, I think, has is, is been a really solid program. I think where we've missed the mark a little bit is in making sure that we're doing projects that are going to really leverage private funds, right? So that $145 million actually can be a multiplier. We've seen this at the county level. You know, they're really investing in fiber, and they're going to work with private partnerships in order to really leverage that money and make it go a lot further. We've seen that in Cleveland as well. When I, when I uh, uh, first heard about ARPA, when ARPA first passed, um, we had an opportunity to submit ideas to the mayor, and I submitted two ideas, now both of which I think are in some stage of development. But uh, there were the right to counsel program, which they have in Cleveland, which helps make sure there's a lawyer for everyone facing eviction, um, which really not only is a matter of basic fairness, but also has helped save millions of dollars in social service money in Cleveland. The second was a co-responder model to make sure that there are mental health and social service workers responding alongside officers to situations where it's appropriate and effective and helpful to do so. Right? In both of those cases, we have actually moved forward with those over the last few years. And this year, there's finally money in the budget for right to counsel. And the police department has, in some ways, said that they support this co-responder model. But I think the point of ARPA was to help pilot things that will help us decide, OK, let's try this for a year. And if it works, we can make this a permanent part of city government. We can test things out, be innovative. You know, At the end of the day, Again, I want to emphasize, it's taxpayer money. This isn't free money that just came out of nowhere, right? And so we shouldn't just use it to spend what we would otherwise spend debt on. We should try to use it to kind of pursue creative and innovative ways of improving city government. Is there a space um, uh, or an area of work for creating jobs, for sort of driving development in our community where you would have prioritized some of those funds or where you think we need to do more? Yeah, I think you know one of the things is our community development corporations really have an opportunity to be big hubs. But I think you know really what we're working on with the university and the polymer space, I think, is a tremendous opportunity. I think obviously the cost for setting up you know a hub mm -hmm. is more than you know just the 145 million um, if we devoted all all of it to that. But I think what we have to do is figure out how do we layer the finances and get local, state, and federal alignment on some of those larger plays like that. Um, and again, so you know, I haven't begrudged the money that we've spent, you know, the EDA money that we've spent on Bounce. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of opportunity with what we're doing. Um, I think the partnerships with the university could be stronger. You know, I think that the turbulence of the last few years, I think Dr. Miller has come in and helped build a little bit more of the relationships there. Um, and then you know, I think at a more basic level, beyond kind of one-time ARPA funding, I really want to make sure city government is a full player when it comes to Elevate Greater Akron and that that becomes permanent. Because like I said, going back a little bit, you know, we have a plan and you know, we're right now in kind of the, the red zone, which is we, we got the plan, we started implementing it with all the different partners, and now we see you know, is it really going to become a permanent fixture beyond one administration, beyond one mayor, beyond one integrated development director and really a permanent fixture. And so a lot of what I'd like to see the city focus on when it comes to economic development is just some of the nuts and bolts of what we're supposed to do, right? Can we improve the contracting processes? Can we improve the BRE processes and how we plug into those? And just make sure that that's reliable and not subject to change You know, uh, when one person leaves from City Office of Integrated Development. Well, I'm going to bite on that. Sorry, yeah. I've got to. Because uh, I think that's one of the things that we've talked a lot about is um, this was stuff was put together in 2018 or so yep. as the uh, county executive and the mayor were both relatively new in their roles or uh, sort of early in first terms. And so institutionalizing this, moving this beyond one administration is something pretty important to us. What components of Elevate Greater Akron do you think hold the most promise for us or how would you sort of task folks within the administration to sort of drive some of that work? 
Absolutely. So I'm really you know, excited at a basic level about what we're doing around BRE. I think it's a lot more efficient than it was five years ago to make sure that we're going around and you know, collaboratively between the city, the county, and the chamber, going to some of our larger employers and employers really of all size and making sure we know, you know what will help you invest more in this community. Right? And so I think someone actually made the metaphor to me recently. They said, in this process, we've kind of really optimized the performance of our race car, right? And now the question is, what are we going to do with mm -hmm. it, right? And so I think where there's opportunity going forward is really for the city, particularly in the minority contracting space. We really, as a city, have to make sure that we are spending more of our city dollars in a public way that more of our minority contractors and women-owned businesses are able to bid on. And some of you may have been following some of what's been discussed over the last few weeks in terms of consulting agreements. You know, at a fundamental level, this isn't about any one particular consulting agreement, but the idea that you know, if you just contract with the people who you've used year after year and you don't post that publicly, folks who have not had their foot in the door for decades are not necessarily going to know they can bid on that work. right? So I think the city, again, as we're moving on into a new administration, needs to make sure that work really is permanent. Um, you know, I really pushed last year to make sure that Robert DeJarnette's role, that the city continued with its funding. Mm -hmm. I think we at the city have have to make sure that you know people have moved on our minority contracting supply diversity officer moved on in January we haven't yet filled that role we have to make sure that that isn't something where it's like a one and done right so I think there's a lot of opportunity there and then I think to go back to the point about the race car and what we can do with it, again, it's some of those larger plays. So now that we've really optimized how we are all working together, let's let's go after some of those bigger things like a polymer play or other things like that, and really see can we can we unlock you know some of the funding that's more on the, not, it's not going to be Intel scale, mm -hmm. but closer to that scale. So as you think about um, unlocking resources and sort of helping businesses to grow, helping jobs to come here. You have spent time inside the city administration. You yep. spent time in the law department. Yep. Are there specific um, ideas or, or things that you've got related to how we make it easier for whether it be uh, businesses or developers or others to work with the city to get things done? Yeah, you know, at a, and this is kind of when I go back to it, a very basic thing, and it's not like glamorous, but just making sure that every interaction that someone has with city government is as straightforward and easy and simple as possible, right? And so you shouldn't have to know, oh, well, my uncle knows this person in the, in the law department or in the service department or what have you. It should be that everyone who's contacting the front door of city government when it comes to economic development really gets the same interaction and there's really a better process and flow chart. You know, when I was in the law department, it was very clear to me that you know, there would be a, a perfect moment if you could freeze everything and really just spend a lot of time making these processes a lot more efficient. Now, you can't do that, but what you can do is just give people much better and clearer expectations. So if you tell people, we're going to give you a contract for $1.5 million, you need to tell the people when they can expect to have that money by, right? And make sure that you're able to deliver it by that date. And again, it doesn't sound, you know, glamorous, it doesn't sound important, but these are some of the blocking and tackling things that I think really will help. You know, when some of our, we've given money to some of our CDCs, and, you know, it's great to have the promise of the money, but how, what is the process uh, by which you actually get there. And so that's one thing I really want to focus on, having that knowledge of how it works inside city government, um, is really making sure that every opportunity that someone engages with city government, whether it's a business or whether it's a resident, there's an opportunity for us as a city to gain trust or lose trust, right? And I would much rather spend our time building up the trust, and then when we go and ask people to invest, then I think we have a lot, a lot better return. Are there specific or significant changes that you would make to sort of key roles on the administration related to engaging with supporting business uh, development and growth, or, or do you feel like the current structure um, is, is good and we just kind of improve the way it operates? So I would make changes. I, I have to be careful not to get too far into the details sure, sure. here. But you know, the tra transition to OID really was like a huge transition, right? And it kind of just happened, right? There was that's the, the Office of Integrated Office Development, of Integrated yeah, development right? Yeah. And this combined you know, planning, economic development, parts of engineering, which never quite made sense to me, which parts, right? Um, and under one person, James Hardy. And James is actually running to take my seat on city council right now. Um, 
But then there was a transition from James to Sean Volman, and and again, I don't. That's why I don't want to make it about personalities. Yeah, sure. And then you know, Katie Breck has come in under Sean, and I think they've tried to divide some of that work that that James was holding all of that single work. They divided it really into two people, and now I think there are going to be some transitions there as well. I've heard, um, and so I think we're really kind of in the process now of figuring out how that works. I think that it's very clear that. You know, this department is, is more than any one singular person can handle. And so I think you do want to kind of break it up a little bit more and make sure that there's someone who's kind of managing day to day, but make sure that it's not, you know, if one person isn't checking their emails or isn't fully responsive, that it all doesn't fall apart, right? That there's a little bit more safeguards in the system there. Overall, I like the idea of making sure that, you know, the, the elements that are there, that planning is talking to engineering, is talking to economic development. Um, they have a meeting, it's like, I don't know, I think it's Wednesdays or Thursdays mornings, EDCC, where everyone gets together within City Hall and talks about these issues. Um, but I think, you know, the other piece of it is also making sure we figure out within Office of Integrated Development which of these priorities we're going to kind of continue to expand on. Right. And one of them is Great Streets, and you might already have heard from Mark Greer. Um, but you know, I worked very closely with Mark when I, as the representative for the Merriman Valley, and you know, it was very clear very early on. I was like, Mark is giving me like concierge service as the Ward 8 representative, but he's dealing with 16 other neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? And so over time, that's been expanded a little bit. But we, I think, really have to make sure that that is a focal point going forward too. So talk about um, talk about downtown. Um, yep. Do you see downtown as a neighborhood? Do you see it as distinct and different than the neighborhoods you were just referencing? How do we think about balancing the priorities there? And or is it you know is it both ends? Is it either or? Just give me your perspectives on that. Yeah. So this is where we have to cut off the camera, and I have to tell you that downtown is great. And then I go in the neighborhoods, <laughs> and I tell the people in the neighborhoods that the neighborhoods are great. Got no, it. we're trying to make sure that we say the same thing to everyone, right? Which is that obviously we need investment in our neighborhoods, but no city, no modern city is going to be successful without a thriving downtown, right? And we have made so many investments in downtown Akron. Really, downtown Akron from a physical infrastructure perspective is beautiful, right? I just came from the Lock 3 opening. I'm going to the uh, Rubber Ducks opener right after this. Uh, we have amazing amenities. The problem with downtown Akron principally is the perception, right? Over the last few years, from the Main Street project to the protests and some of the property damage that I think these windows got knocked out, right? Um, the perception that people have of downtown is difficult. And then every single city in America is dealing with the issue of downtown and COVID and remote work. I think that piece will shake out. But I think we have an opportunity as a city to help move the ball forward substantially. You know, we have in, in law created a downtown community development corporation. I think that has to be stood up and actually really be given some functional power and some functional authority, make sure that we're able to find a couple different revenue streams so it can be funded. Mm -hmm. And then that CDC can help move some of the kind of day-to-day -day work that often, you know, in city government, if the people in the Office of Integrated Development are spending all of their time focused on exactly what's going on with the deed for, you know, one particular building, you know, they're wasting time, not wasting time, but they're using time mm -hmm. that could be better spent on other priorities. And so if we have an entity really that's driving that forward, one of the things we talked about a while back now, I think it was in August, was about making sure we just have a, a list of all of the leases that are with downtown you know, office space and making sure that we know that as a collective mm -hmm. so that as people are coming to us that we know how to slot them in appropriately and we're not just kind of guessing off of what people's you know, back of the napkin work is. So I think there's a lot of opportunity when it comes down to downtown. And I think you know, we, we as a city have to better communicate to people about what's down here. I think DAP does a decent job with that. But I think you know, we need to show people uh, that there's opportunity. And then the final thing is I'm going to call out uh, Don Disler because I've been doing this all across town, right? We have a tremendous opportunity you know, when it comes to some of the ideas around um, uh, transit. right? And transit-oriented development really will help us here. You know, if we are able to put some kind of childcare or mixed-use development, but principally childcare, right by the Metro Transit Center, not only does it help people who are traveling and transferring through on the bus lines, uh, saving them you know, an hour or two of their time every day, but also it helps people who are working in the AES building, people who are working just across there in, in Goodrich, people who are working a little bit further down, right? And maybe will help us incentivize bringing some people back downtown over time as all of this shakes out. 
Um, so those, I mean, there are manifold ideas, but those are a couple of them. I love the fact that you talk fast like I do, so we can cover a lot of ground here. So uh, yeah. not one or two ideas, but about 10 ideas. Yeah. So, so let's talk for a second about people, um, because you know there's a lot of inputs to our success in terms of creating job and creating development in our community. One is workforce. Yeah. And our biggest factory for workforce, if you will, in this community is Akron Public Schools. Yep. And you alluded to earlier, I mean, there's a lot of issues going on there. Some, A lot of folks perceive there are a lot of issues happening there. We've made a big investment in our college and career academy yep. um, activities in this community to try to find a connection between um, education and career development for our students. Talk about the role you'd play as mayor with the schools, right? The mayor doesn't own the schools in mm -hmm. this community, but you do have a bully pulpit from which you can sort of push ideas. Talk about that intersection. Yeah, so a couple things. First of all, you know, the mayor does not run the schools. We have an independently elected school board. Mm -hmm. The mayor technically kind of does own the schools you know, because we help pay for these CLC buildings, right? Sure. And so you know, we have a really important role to be a partner within this process. And the turbulence that we've seen within Akron Public Schools over the last few years is it's really like heartbreaking to watch, right? I mean, I, again, I said to you, I'm, I'm really only here before you because of the IB program at Firestone High School. Every kid in Akron Public Schools deserves an amazing education, right? People shouldn't feel, there was a comment made yesterday in the debate, people shouldn't feel like they're stuck in Akron Public Schools, right? It should be a place where kids thrive. The, the chaos of the last few years has been really unfortunate. I think in a situation like that, I've been very vocal, I've been vocal publicly, and I've been vocal privately to the board members, but the mayor's role is to be a convener and to bring people together around a table and say, look, there are disagreements between the superintendent, the board, the union, and others, but how are we going to work through those and make sure that it doesn't start spiraling out of control, really to the point that we are right now. But backing up a little bit, some of the substantive things that I think really will improve our education system are, there are two of them specifically. One is universal pre-K, right? Study after study after study across the country will show you that communities that are able to invest in affordable early learning for their kids will have better educational outcomes, but also will help deal with some of the behavioral issues that we're seeing in our schools, right? The safety issues in our schools like threaten any kind of learning in those school buildings, right? And then the second thing is these CLCs. So a lot of discussion has gone into safety and our kids, right? If we are using those buildings and truly using them as community centers on the evenings and weekends and programming them better, right? The city has uh, had some minor role there, but we have to be a much more active partner. And GAR and United Way and others are talking about this concept of out of school time, right? Every young person who walks into an Akron Public Schools building should be connected to some form of extracurricular that is going to ground them after the school day in something that will excite them and energize them and you know, give them something beyond the school day to look forward to and get energized about. And, and we can do that as a community. They're doing it in Boston right now. They're doing it in other communities. And that's those, so those are two big things that we want to focus on. But at the very basic level, we just have to get back to stability, right? I mean, we just signed a, not we, but Akron Public Schools just signed an agreement with the teachers union that is going to require a levy. How are you going to pass a levy when people are losing faith Ever, oh, like day to day in the school district. And so we have to get that ship righted, and then we can go after some of these longer term things. So uh, one more question related to the schools, and then maybe open it up for questions from the group here. Um, I was looking at some data recently that talks about the value of these out-of-time school networks, the value of keeping um, students engaged after school at 3 o'clock or so yep. into the evenings. Uh, one of the things, 10 years ago or so, we had a thousand sort of jobs in our youth job program. Now that number is down, you know, dramatically lower to something yep. like 100. Are there specific ideas you have around, would, would you prioritize that? Is getting these kids jobs something that you think would be an important way of getting there? Or just talk about that for a second. Absolutely. So, you know, there's an organization up in Cleveland, Youth Opportunities Unlimited, right? Mm -hmm. And they help, you know, as the primary partner with uh, Cleveland Public Schools, CMSD, in you know summer employment and youth employment and so they came down I think this past year and helped partner on a small pilot with Akron Public Schools but I think this is really a key piece I think when you look at the out of school time network there are a couple different ways in which people can engage right there are kind of more traditional extracurriculars like sports and music and arts and things like that right there are things like youth employment and then there are things that are more related to the college and career academies, right? And we have this amazing partnership. I think the key is that, you know, the partnership started right before COVID. And so we have to make sure that we're really full
fully leveraging that, right? There are, there are I think, over 100 corporate partners, and I think some of them are more built out than others. And I think there's tremendous opportunity with this out-of-school network to really reassess and say, who, who, where are the areas where you know it's going really well? Where are the areas where it could go a lot deeper? Right? I was just we were both there over at Sterling. Sterling is one of the newest partners I think with North High School, mm -hmm. and you know Sterling is a, a global company, right? Gojo right behind me is a global company, right? I mean we have tremendous opportunity to get our kids engaged and excited in kind of global issues, right? Gojo helped lead the entire world through a pandemic. Right? I think there's, there's so much opportunity. Again, it, it gets to this idea of how do we make sure that the experience that kids have, not just in the school building, but, but after the school day, is something that they don't feel stuck in, but something where they're thriving. Questions uh, that any of you may have for Shamas that you want to throw out there? Because I can keep <coughs> going, but <laughs> please. Yep. So the so, question was, what will the first 90 days in office look like for you? And I'm really glad you asked, Ebony, and Maria's, <coughs> Maria's our campaign manager. Maria's really glad that you asked because we just uh, sent the Beacon Journal an op-ed that will uh, share those things, and I will give you guys a sneak peek, right? So the first is safety, right? Safety, when I go to every neighborhood in our city, safety is what people are talking about. And so we have a plan, Safer Together, on our website, but we are going to really start the process of making sure we invest in community policing in a meaningful way. We're going to find a permanent solution to the APD building downtown where the elevators don't work, and it's a terrible place to work, frankly. Um, and then we are also going to work on making sure we're building trust and uh, finding ways to really move through the challenging times that we're working on uh, when it comes to race relations and our policing, right? Um, I've been at the forefront of that with issue 10. Um, there are two other things that are really important to me, right? The second is modernizing our city government, creating an open and modern city hall, right? And I talked about this a little bit before, so I won't mm -hmm. go into too much detail, but just at a very basic level, assessing the interactions that people are having when they come and engage with each city process, whether it's the process of zoning or whether it's the process of you know, engaging with water and sewer, and figuring out how we can improve those processes and make sure that you know, we're bringing things online just this past week in our budget, we got funding for the first time to uh, put our city housing inspectors uh, with iPads. And so we are no longer going to be doing our housing inspections with pen and paper. But there are so many things like that where we really are operating uh, several decades back. If you look at our city website, we're several decades back. Um, and then the final thing is really better communication. Right? And so, again, I mentioned this before, but you know, the mayor has a, a pretty significant bully pulpit. Right? And I think when we're seeing kind of a fractured media ecosystem with the Beacon and with others, the mayor has the opportunity really to communicate a vision to people and get people excited about it and, and moving together through it. And so you know, we are going to be communicating our priorities, and then we're going to be moving forward in kind of what we're calling a measured way. Right? We have these bold ideas for year four, year one, year four, and beyond, and those are going to be our priorities. Right? But we are also going to make sure that we are fiscally responsible. We're going to be tightening our belt when it comes to spending that we can't afford, whether it's some of those consulting contracts, whether it's our two city golf courses. Uh, but we're also going to be figuring out how we can take some of those bigger priorities and uh, find alignment at the local, state, and federal level and going after some bigger dollars when it comes to those larger priorities. Right? We're not going to do universal pre-K as a community without figuring out how we get Governor DeWine on board and whether it's starting with a pilot, but it's going to have to be a much bigger operation. So those are the three things. Right? It's safety, it's modernizing city government, and then it's moving forward with our priorities in a way that really is fiscally responsible and is measured and is thoughtful. Other questions? Go ahead, Mark. Uh, Sean, you touched on this a little bit earlier. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, with the grand jury convening next week yes. and with the allusion to, to the downtown damage last summer, yep. what would be your message to the community now if you were mayor? What would you be saying to the community as we approach the next couple? Yeah. So the question is, what would your message be to the community as we approach the next couple of weeks as we deal with the grand jury deliberations for the Jalen Walker case? Yeah, and you know, uh, I was just driving here and I saw you know the boarded up buildings that are there, and the municipal building and other buildings, and it took me back to last summer. You know, last summer was an incredibly difficult moment for our community. 
the days after Jalen Walker were killed, was killed uh, were you know, some of the most stressful that I, in, in my service to the city. Um, and our co whole community was in crisis. And there's so much pain that, that was there and still is there, right? And I think what the, the tense moment that we are in right now is everyone figuring out there's no way of, there's nothing that a grand jury is gonna say that is gonna fix that wound in the community, right? There's no outcome that is gonna truly bring justice, right? And so there is a lot of tension, right? Are we gonna see more uh, boarded up windows and more broken, broken windows? I think the, the real key, and there's no, um, there's no one size fits all solution, right? But I think the one place, I said this yesterday at the debate, where there is an opportunity, I think, to do things a little differently, learn from the lessons of last year, is to communicate a little bit more openly and more often, right? When Jalen Walker was killed, it was six days until that video was released. And the information kind of petered out in the media. And people, all kinds of narratives kind of got started before information could get out there. And then when we had the actual press conference, there wasn't a whole lot of information that actually was available. I think it's really important, and I give the administration credit that they're trying to do now, really trying to get as much information out as possible. You know, when the, uh, when the decision from the grand jury comes out, either way, the Ohio Attorney General's office is gonna release a report and if we base it on what we saw from the shooting the January 1st, 2022 in Canton, that report is gonna be over a thousand pages of documents. There's gonna to be tons of detail about what happened on that day, right? And it's probably, and again, I don't wanna prejudge any of it, but it's probably going to portray a pretty complex situation, right? In which, um, you know, I, I think it's very clear that no amount, there's no justification for that amount of shots being fired, particularly at someone who's on the ground. But also we're going to learn, you know, some details about was there a weapon? Did Jalen Walker file, fire a weapon? I think it's really incumbent on the mayor to really take that nuance and deliver it to the community, right? And to really speak to exactly what information we learn and share it with the community, and then be willing to hold space for whatever feelings come about as a result of that, right? And it's very clear, you know, I actually came down here that night, uh, that first night, July 3rd, when they're right before some of those riots broke out, and I saw the tension in the, in the atmosphere, and then I saw the fires that someone had set on Main Street, right? Anyone who engages in that has to be arrested and prosecuted, it's totally unacceptable, right? At the same time, we have to really be better as a community when it comes to dealing with protests. We've seen over the last few weeks people, uh, cases brought to the municipal building, uh, municipal court for protesting, and p person after person get off, right? Because really it was an arrest that shouldn't have been made in the first place. And so we as a city have to be better about how we deal with the protesters. Other questions? So when you think about um, the back to economic development and sort of job creation and sort of creating more companies, more investment in our community. You talk a lot about we need to be more collaborative and consensus driven in terms of the way we lead. Yep. What tools would you like to see us increase in the city to sort of help spur development here? And how would the city play a role in driving some of that development? Absolutely. So, you know, I think that part of the issue is that we have been pretty siloed, right? And I mentioned this before. I think Elevate Greater Akron has helped us get out of the silos. But fundamentally, what I think we need to be doing is going to some of these, uh, going to all of our you know, business community partners and saying, how do we help you invest, right? What would allow you to invest more, right? And, and then figure out, okay, how are we going to be able to get that done? And I think, you know, I could be wrong, but I think that fundamentally when we talk about Elevate Greater Akron, that still there are city projects and county projects and chamber projects, right? And I think we have an opportunity to kind of get beyond that and really make sure we're moving forward. I really want to see a much stronger relationship between UA, Stark State, and the city of Akron and the broader community, right? I really believe the University of Akron can be the engine of economic growth for our city, but if the University of Akron struggles, continues to struggle, if it falls into the same spiral, right? If it becomes Kent State West or, or Cleveland State South, 
we as a community are in a, a world of hurt, right? Mm -hmm. Um, lives are transformed every day up at the University of Akron. And so I think that partnership is, is really a cornerstone thing to me and making sure that they're working with Stark State and not competing and also make sure that we're working with those broader partners like Kent State and like Cleveland State. We are a regional economy. Um, and the other point on that regionalism is, you know, when we talk about things like polymers, we do want to recognize that, you know, all of those companies are not just within the city of Akron municipal boundaries, right? They're within a broader region. And so how do we figure out how we are working with not just our suburbs, but working with Cleveland and working with the broader region to kind of, you know, we have uh, the, the general consensus, right? But how do we really deepen those partnerships so that, you know, they talk about it's a 45 minute drive from Akron to Cleveland and a two hour drive from Cleveland right. to Akron. Right? How can we shorten that a little bit and make sure there's more synergy? Yeah, I think that the good news is that I think we have seen a little bit more, uh, actually not a little bit, a lot more collaboration on the project side, yep. right? Um, there's a lot more teaming on that work than has happened before. Um, but I do think your comments earlier about we decide as a community, we want to see something happen across the street from Canal Park, yep. right? We want to see something happen in Lot 3. We want to see something happen in Firestone. You know, some very specific things that we can all rally around yep. with a real clear leadership signal from the city as to here's how we're going to investigate that happen. I think that's sort of what you're talking about a little bit, but that's the kind of thing that um, I think could help the city in terms of saying this is what we're going to do. I agree, and I think you know part of it is that it it not be so project based, right? Yep. But be kind of this initiative based, and say you know we as our if we as a community are going to become a polymer city, right? It's more than just you know kind of this like three year project, right? It is going to be a whole of community effort. I think we're building towards that. Justin, uh, I'm going to take you up on your challenge of asking a question that maybe you haven't had yet. Let's go. Make sure I can summarize it, Justin, all right? So go ahead. <laughs> um, so the Greater Akron Chamber, you know, a couple weeks ago, they had their annual meeting. There were close to 1,000 people at the Jobs Night Dinner. The keynote was the CEO of Gallup, and he came in and he said three, uh, three pretty pivotal things. The first of which, and, and, and the room was filled with some of our our region's top employers, right? He said the number one thing that's the most important right now is that employers care about how their employees feel, okay? And so my question is, we're a city, and you know, the, the title of your, the mayor of the city of Akron, right? But you don't have a city without people. And so people are the most important. So yes, we've got to do operational things and transactional things, and yes, but how do you create an atmosphere and environment in which people feel cared for and they feel good about being here? Uh, well, you made that easy for me, Justin. I'm going to try again to sort of say that, but how do you create an atmosphere as the mayor that people feel like they are cared for uh, people feel like that they're sort of heard and that they, they want to be here in the city. Is that fair? Thank you, Justin. Um, I think that, you know, I mentioned those four things that I think are, are holding us back, right? I mean, we have been, and I don't want to, you know, maybe this isn't helpful, but we've been managing decline for decades. And the challenge for anyone who wants to sit in the mayor's seat is how are we going to leverage all of the amazing talent in our community? We have everything we need, but how are we going to leverage that talent to do things differently? And there are these four issues, safety, housing, education, and jobs, right? And without these things, but, but I mentioned safety first, because without safety, you know, you are not focused on, you know, how, you, how your job's going. You're not focused on some of those other things. You're just focused on, you know, making sure that your kid is going to come home at the end of the day. You're focused on making sure that, you know, your, your, your basic, basic needs are met. Um, we as a city have the primary role in delivering safety, and in a lot of our neighborhoods, that's just not the case, right? And so that's why I, I kind of had the, as the centerpiece. But the reason that we've really built this campaign around this kind of together for Akron vision on these four things 
is that I think we have tremendous opportunity around these issues, but how, we need to show people that we are working on it. We need to communicate that, and then we need to be constantly engaging with them about how we can make that experience better. So, you know, throughout my time on council, I have seen a city government that constantly gets kind of input from people at the end, right? You know, when we talk about the White Pond development, no matter what anyone thinks about the White Pond development, it's very clear to me that the 200 person meeting at St. Sebastian of residents should happen not the week before the vote, but at the beginning of the process. So we are getting that input and people are feeling heard, right? If, if people live in a community where they don't feel like the city government has their best interests at heart, and government at every level has been losing people's trust for decades for very good reasons, right? We have to be doing some very basic work of rebuilding that trust. And so, you know, again, I, I, um, I don't want to make lofty statements. I want to say these are some f four very basic things that I want everyone to know the city is working on, right? I want everyone who lives in this community to know we are working on making your community safer. And here are the four ways we're doing it. Here are the metrics that we are trying to meet. And here's how we're publicly communicating about that very openly and very clearly. And then inviting your feedback, not to just go and check a box, but really to um, make sure that we're, we're doing it in a way that is responsive to people. So we've taken these four ideas. We've put out plans on our website. Again, I think we've done that in a stronger way than any other campaign. But what we've also done is already have four community conversations in different corners of our neighborhood, listening to what people's reactions to those are, and then taking back and iterating and working on it from there. Right? And you know, the one point you made about employers, I think, is, is relevant. Is relevant. You know, we hear this idea that, that people don't want to work anymore. And I think we all know that it's more complicated than that. But the thing that I've really seen is that, you know, there are some very basic obstacles that are keeping people from a job, right? Affordable transportation, affordable childcare, right? If we can make progress on those as a community, we can really make people's experience living in the city a whole lot better and make people more excited about living, working uh, in this community. Thank you. Great question. Any other questions? I have another question. So we um, really appreciate your comments around minority contracting and um, improving the narrative for our communities that we use in the region. Uh, the Chamber, along with Metro and some other partners, has begun a supply and diversity initiative. Yep. So um, you mentioned uh, about the um, consulting agreements and maybe more transparency around that. But can you share with us how do we really begin to shift the narrative to ensure that our minority business owners have access to opportunities So how do we shift the narrative to make sure our minority business owners have access to opportunities with the city, uh, I would presume, and with other partners to begin to see growth in their businesses? Yeah, so thank you again for the question. Um, this one, again, I think if there's, some, there's some pretty basic things we can start doing. So right now, I am on the uh, Supplier Diversity Committee for Akron Waterways Renewed, which is you know, our big sewer project, right? And um, actually, no one asked me if I wanted to be on this committee. I just got an email one day that I was on this <laughs> committee. So I showed up to the first meeting. And this meeting, I don't know, maybe it was in November of this past year. And um, at the meeting, they talked about how we have a supplier diversity goal for each project, right? And for each project, RAC 34, RAC 40, RAC 42, right? It's you know, a certain percentage, 15%, 20%, right? And so the main contractor is bidding on this. Um, and they have to be willing to meet this percentage for women-owned businesses and for minority-owned businesses, right? And the thing that got me was that we were actually accepting bids that were below those thresholds for those two requirements, right? And so to me, if, and so there was this, this disagreement, what is the actual threshold that we're required under the law, right? Is it the, what we set out initially when we did the bid documents? Or is it what we accepted and the company actually said they would be willing to do with their subs? And the reality is that it is that second one, right? And, um, and so we are kind of 
from the gate setting our goal too, too low. Now the issue there that then if you dig into it further is that folks will say, well the problem is that we've set an across the board threshold and percentage and that can't be met for every project. Well, I'm not so sure that's true, but if that is true, then there should be unique goals for each project, right, that are realistic goals. And then we should be willing to hold ourselves to those and really make sure that we are meeting those. And you know, we've made some progress there, but I think that just one anecdote demonstrates that you know, the actual follow through and kind of holding our own feet to the fire is not fully present in the situation at this time, right? And so I think we wanna do that. And then beyond that, there's a lot of opportunity the city has. Um, uh, you know, even with, uh, we have a, a, an engineering internship program every year, right? And we have amazing contracting partners that help place high school students in these positions, right? And are really enriching positions where they can learn. I think one of the issues is that, you know, every year we have had kind of the same number of people. We should be going to some of these folks and saying, hey, can you take five more kids? Can you take 10 more kids? And trying to expand and grow those programs over time. Um, so I think there are a lot of things we can do, uh, but I think in, in doing those things, I want to make sure that we're communicating about it more publicly and really publicly holding our own feet to the fire. And so when we, when we uh, mess up or when we you know, fall short of a goal, I want us to be acknowledging that in public and so people know that we are working on it and know why we didn't get there and what we plan to do about it going forward. Yeah, I think it's a, a great point that we are not going to hit all the goals that yeah. we set. Yeah. But when we don't hit them, we identify that we didn't and why and what we're going to do differently. So Absolutely. I appreciate the perspective. OK, well, uh, I appreciate your time today, uh, Councilman Sean Smalik, uh, for a uh, candidate for mayor for the city of Akron. Uh, we wish you luck on the campaign trail as you move forward here. You know, but we, I think I do want to express our appreciation for your willingness to put yourself out in front in this race. Um, uh, with all of our other candidates to say I'm willing to take on the responsibility and to step into this. We know public office is not easy. Uh, nobody ever calls you and says great job. Uh, they usually have something that you've got to do or do differently so we appreciate your willingness to sort of step into this arena and uh, look forward to speaking with you as we move forward. Can I say one more thing Steve? Absolutely. Uh, that point. You know this process has not been easy. We're 26 days away from the end of the election but I really in every room I go into I'm inspired right? We have this whole community is full of people who are working on making a difference, right? I really believe we can shift the narrative and shift the outcomes, but it really will require us all doing it together. I think there's no better words to end on. Thank no, you very much. Thank you.